everyone. Welcome, today's pro welcome to today's program on white supremacy in 2021, putting violent extremism on trial. I'm Phyllis Leffler, moderator for this event. I'm the immediate past president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society and a 35 year resident of Charlottesville, Virginia, where the Unite the Right rally took place. Thanks to all of you for joining us. I also want to thank our co-sponsors for today's program. In addition to the Southern Jewish Historical Society, co-sponsors include the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, the Bremen Museum, the Jewish Community Relations Council of Atlanta, and the Atlanta Jews of Color Council. Today's program is a webinar, and we invite you to submit questions throughout the program through the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. Thanks again for joining us for this important discussion with Integrity First for America. To begin our conversation today and frame what we are doing, we're honored to have Reverend John Vaughn, executive pastor of the historic Ebenezer Baptist Church of Atlanta. Welcome, Reverend Vaughn. Thank you so much, Phyllis. It's good to be with you today. So I was asked just to offer just a few framing words. So I, I, won't, um, I won't speak long, which are famous last words from a Baptist minister. One of the themes I've been reflecting on theologically over this last year has been the theme of wilderness. Specifically, I've been thinking about wilderness that we find in the book of Exodus in the Hebrew Bible. One of the insights that I've had over this past year is that wilderness can be a time of preparation and formation. The pandemic really for many of us has been a wilderness that has both unmoored us in so many ways and forced us inside but it's also been a time of preparing us for a world that will not be the same when we emerge on the other side. This wilderness moment has also been a time when things have started to shift or some things have started to shift in terms of race within the United States. There was something that shifted for many in our country when witnessing the murder of George Floyd, seeing the knee of Officer Chauvin on his neck, we at Ebenezer started to see this tangible form of shift in our own growing digital community. We now have friends who are actively engaged in our ministries digitally from New York and San Diego, Illinois, Texas, Arizona, Ohio, South Africa to Germany. But what's new is that they represent a racially diverse group of people who are eager to connect with an historic black church with deep social justice roots. Over Lent, we convened a book study on Isabel Wilkerson's groundbreaking book, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontent. We brought together members of Ebenezer, historically black congregation with St. Luke's Episcopal Church, mainly white congregation, and to our surprise, over 300 people from our congregations signed up to walk together through a book that tackles the deep entrenchment of race and racism in our country. This shift in the national conversation around race now seems to have increased the amount of white people who don't view racism now as a problem for people of color to solve, but one that must be owned and led by white people. Discussions about the harmful effects of white supremacy are no longer happening around the fringes, but they are now front and center within our public dialogue. So today we stand at the edge of the wilderness. We can feel the oppressive fog of the pandemic slowly starting to lift. And at the same time, as Pastor Warnock has oftentimes said, the pandemic of 1619 
That's the year that Africans were first crossed to the soil here in the United States. We began to see that pandemic is actually redoubling its efforts. Racism is morphing yet again. The New York Times did a range of stories reflecting on the one year anniversary of George Floyd's death. One story chronicled a conversation with 12 conservative Americans. When asked how many of them felt that George Floyd was responsible for his own death, 11 of them raised their hands. I recently had dinner with a white childhood friend who now lives in Charlotte. One of the questions she asked me was, what do I say to people who tell me that the main reason that unarmed black people are being killed by law enforcement is because they were resisting arrest. Black Lives, the Black Lives Matter movement is a peaceful social protest movement, but now it's been labeled by some of its opponents as violent and anti-democratic in an attempt to undermine its legitimacy and growing popularity. We see voter suppression aimed at the states where people of color organized and asserted electoral power. We see new legislation seeking to criminalize the act of protesting. We see the impact of gerrymandering that tends to disadvantage communities of color. We see new efforts to purge voter rolls, many of whom are people of color. We saw with our own eyes people storm the U.S. Capitol on January 6th. The faces I saw were white faces and some of them carrying Confederate flags. And this happened the day after an improbable electoral victory powered by people of color asserting their political power materialized here in Georgia on the 5th. As we watched and saw rioters on the Capitol on January 6th, many of them gathered for a prayer service as they connected their actions to God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So you ask me, why is it important, given everything that's happened this year, to have a program on accountability for white supremacists that brings together communities across Atlanta and the South. Well, the overt and covert narratives powered by white supremacists that do not see black people and other people of color as full, as full human beings is winning the day in some of our communities and is even getting religious affirmation. It's easy to place one's knee on another person's neck use a chokehold to snuff out someone's life or fire first and ask questions later, if at some deeper unconscious place, you don't really see people of color as fully human. Quite simply, if we do not hold the narratives and actions that perpetrate hate, that undermine the personhood and humanity of others, the challenge, if we don't hold them accountable, then such words and actions become normalized. It's just another killing that happens and then the waters wash over. In my faith tradition, Jesus was actively challenging the Roman empire and religious authorities who were invested in marginalizing others. Jesus starts out his ministry by stating, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because God has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and to let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of God's favor. After finishing reading this, he states today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So why is this important? because the humanity of all, particularly those who find themselves individually, institutionally, and societally deemed as less than fully human is at stake. We cannot allow these actions, we cannot allow these attitudes to be normalized. Why is it important? 
because the humanity of all, particularly those who find themselves individually, institutionally, and societally deemed as less than human, is at stake. Amen. Let me now pass things back to, to Phyllis, who will move us through the next part of our program. Thank you, Reverend Vaughn, for those extremely important and powerful remarks. Uh, so important for us to hear them as we begin this program today. I also want to um, just quickly announce that this program, after our moderated discussion, uh, will be, uh, we will be uh, also addressed briefly by Rabbi Joseph Prass, uh, who is the head of the Weinberg Holocaust Center at the Bremen Museum. But let us begin. In August 2017, neo-Nazis and white supremacists descended on Charlottesville, Virginia for a weekend of violence. As I indicated earlier, I've lived in Charlottesville since 1986. I'm also an historian and have written and published on the history of the Jews of Charlottesville. And I can tell you that for most of its history, Charlottesville has been a very comfortable place for Jews. So on August 11th and 12th, we were shocked, as was the nation and the world, by what happened when neo-Nazis marched down the streets and on the grounds of the University of Virginia, chanting, Jews will not replace us, spewing other white supremacist rhetoric while carrying semi-automatic weapons dressed in Nazi garb and beating up counter protesters. We as Jews were shocked, but we subsequently learned that our African-American neighbors were not and feel that they have lived with a fear of white supremacists, racist actions and police brutality all their lives. The confluence of racism and anti-Semitism as elements of white supremacy is something we will be talking about today in the context of the important work of Integrity First for America. The violence that occurred in Charlottesville was no accident. Rather, it was the result of months of planning and it previewed the extremist terror that has followed and now seems both familiar and increasingly ominous. Integrity First for America in partnership with a world-class legal team is uniquely taking on individuals and hate groups at the center of this violent movement, holding them accountable in federal court for the violence they brought to Charlottesville in 2017. As report after report underscores the urgency of combating white supremacy and violent extremism in America, IFA's work is all the more critical. So we're joined today by IFA Executive Director Amy Spitalnik and Professor Charles Chavis, Director of the John Mitchell Jr. Program for History, Justice and Race at George Mason University to discuss this landmark lawsuit and the fight against violent hate in America. But before we hear from them, we're going to begin with a brief video to take us back to what happened in Charlottesville. As you can imagine, this video has some disturbing images and sounds. But let's take a look at this very short two minute video before we begin our conversation. Charlotte's dark displays of racism. Trying to promote my car has rammed into a crowd. Victims thrown in the air. Deadly act of domestic terror. One woman dead, others killed. Tenth 
people who were injured in Charlottesville, including three of the people who were hit by that car and survived, have now brought a lawsuit against not only the murderer who drove his vehicle into the crowd, but also the leaders of all of the white nationalist groups that organized and promoted the Charlottesville event. We are Integrity First for America. We are here to disrupt the extremism, to interrupt the cycle, to dismantle and bankrupt these hate groups and their leaders, to put them out of business, and most importantly, to stop the violence. Integrity First for America is leading the fight against white supremacy. Our Charlottesville lawsuit is the only current legal effort taking on the broad leadership of this movement, holding white supremacists accountable for their premeditated violence. We know that it's working. They're already facing huge financial and legal consequences, but we also know what we're up against. Bankrupting Nazis isn't cheap. These groups are still recruiting, weaponizing fear, and preparing for their next attack. Now more than ever, we are reminded of our obligation to dismantle the systems of white supremacy that poison this country. Turn your outrage into action, because hate has no place here. Okay. So I do want to welcome now to the screen, to the screen, uh, Amy Spitalnik and uh, Professor Charles Chavis. And I'd like to begin by asking Amy just a brief question. Can you take us back to 2017 and describe in a little bit more detail exactly what happened in Charlottesville? And at the same time, could you talk a little bit about the case at the center of this work? Uh, tell us a little bit who the defendants are, uh, who their targets were, et cetera. Absolutely. And thank you so much, Phyllis and Reverend Vaughn, for that powerful introduction. And Professor Chavis, so wonderful to be with you here as well. Um, there's so much to say about what happened in Charlottesville in 2017, and I know we'll continue to talk about it over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. I think what's really important to understand is that Charlottesville wasn't a flashpoint, or rather it wasn't an isolated incident, it was a flashpoint. It was a harbinger, a preview of the cycle of extremist white supremacist violence that has followed and that has really reached crisis levels in this country. It was the sadly natural culmination of disinformation, of hate, of racism, of anti-Semitism, of bigotry that has been allowed to fester and grow un with so little accountability in uh, over, frankly, the course of this country's history, but particularly in recent years, as we see this hate reach record levels. Um, as you saw in that video, and as Phyllis alluded to in her opening remarks, um, the weekend of August 11th and 12th was not an accident, but a planned weekend of violence in which everything that happened was meticulously discussed and planned for months in advance on social media. First on Friday, August 11th, 2017, I think many of us remember the visceral feeling of watching neo-Nazis carrying tiki torches, which they specifically chose to evoke the KKK and the Nazis. They marched on the University of Virginia, chanting things like Jews will not replace us, blood and soil, white lives matter, they surrounded a small group of peaceful counter protesters at the Thomas Jefferson statue on campus, kicked, punched, beat them up, threw fuel and lit torches at them. One of our plaintiffs, a black undergrad at the university said he thought he was going to die that night and nearby an interfaith gathering had to shelter in place because it was so unsafe outside their doors. Ironic because that was meant to be a safe space for the community to come together in light of white supremacists coming to town. The next day, Saturday, August 12th, um, we know sadly how that day culminated in the car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured so many others, including many of our plaintiffs. But it was truly a day and a weekend of violence. It was a Saturday, so it was a Shabbat and the synagogue in downtown Charlottesville was marking Shabbat as you would every single Saturday. Um, these neo-Nazis marched this time on downtown Charlottesville under the guise of protesting the removal of the Robert E. Lee Confederate monument as I alluded to, and as I'm sure we'll discuss uh, today, that was never the actual intention of the weekend. The intention was violence. 
They surrounded the synagogue, chanting things like Sieg Heil, carrying semi-automatic weapons, talking in their online chats about, quote, torching those Jewish monsters. The synagogue had to evacuate congregants and Torah scrolls out the back. The detail that always gets me is that the synagogue was home to a Torah scroll saved from Nazi Germany decades ago. And in America in 2017, it was once again under Nazi threat. And that just sort of grabs me no matter how often I read it in our lawsuit. The violence continued throughout the day. These extremists charged a line of interfaith clergy, um, including our plaintiff, Reverend Seth Wispelway, who was marching arm in arm with other faith leaders like Cornell West and others. Um, they specifically targeted the black neighborhoods in Charlottesville where they drove these white Mercedes vans through those neighborhoods, terrorizing communities even days after the violence. And of course, the the day culminated in the car attack that we all know so well at this point, killing Heather Heyer, injuring many of our plaintiffs, as you saw in that video, folks like Marcus Martin and Marissa Blair, Marcus has seen in that Pulitzer winning photo of the car going through the crowd sprawled across the back wearing a white tank top and red sneakers. He had then he had pushed his then fiance, now wife Marissa out of the way, saving her life. Both were grievously injured as were so many others like Natalie Romero, whose skull was fractured in the attack, Thomas Baker, Chelsea Alvarado, um, all of their injuries were not just, of course, physical, but of course, psychological as well in terms of the impact of surviving the unthinkable as they all did. What's important to understand here is that nothing that happened in Charlottesville that weekend was an accident. But as I said, it was meticulously planned for months in advance on social media, specifically on a site called Discord, which some of you might know because it's frequently used by video gamers to chat while playing a game. It's not a site that was built intentionally for the purposes of planning and promoting extremism like some other fringe sites are. Discord is a mainstream social media site that these extremists co-opted in the months leading up to Unite the Right and meticulously planned every detail in advance from the mundane and banal, what to wear, what to bring to lunch, how do you best sew a swastika onto a flag? Hannah Arendt once wrote about the banality of evil and I think these chats really reflect that uh, to, so perfectly well. And of course, they discuss the vile and the violent. Um, how do you use a supposed free speech instrument like a flagpole to attack people? And even whether they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense, which is of course precisely what they did. So that's not an accident. That's not a clash between two different sides. That is a racist, violent conspiracy. And we have laws that are meant to protect against that. Um, and so using those laws, on behalf of our plaintiffs, the Charlottesville community members who were injured, we are taking to court through a federal lawsuit, the two dozen neo-Nazis, white supremacists and hate groups most directly responsible for planning, orchestrating and executing that violence. Our suit alleges a racist, a racially motivated conspiracy under a number of state and federal statutes, but the one that is always most of interest is something called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. This statute is exactly 150 years old. It was passed and signed into law by President Grant in April of 1871, intended to give recently freed slaves who were being violently attacked by Klansmen in the South a right of recourse, a way to protect them from this racist violence that was intended to undermine their civil rights, their recently won 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment rights. It's been used occasionally throughout history in moments that you might expect, including in the early 1900s when the Klan was resurgent again during the Freedom Rider era. And we are using it here to hold accountable these neo-Nazis and white supremacists for their racist violent conspiracy. There's so much more to say about the defendants, the plaintiffs, I'll just end by saying the defendants in our lawsuit are names that I suspect many of you will know quite well. Folks like Richard Spencer, Andrew Anglin, who runs the neo-Nazi site, The Daily Stormer, League of the South, which is a neo-Confederate hate group, certain Klan groups, Vanguard America, which is the group that James Fields, who drove the car, was in Charlottesville with. Fields himself is also a defendant. Matthew Heimbach, Traditionalist Workers' Party, National Socialist Movement, which is one of the country's largest neo-Nazi organizations. It really is a who's who of this movement that unsurprisingly was directly responsible for the racist violent conspiracy in Charlottesville, but also has deep and disturbing connections to the broader cycle of hate. We know, for example, the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 Jews praying in synagogue two and a half years ago, communicated with some of the Charlottesville leaders before his attack. The Christchurch shooter who killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosque in New Zealand two years ago, donated to two of our defendants and painted onto his gun a white power symbol popularized by a third. 
Christ Church was live streamed on Facebook and in turn inspired the Chabad attack in California two years ago, the El Paso Walmart attack, and on and on it goes. And so you see how the cycle of violence, of white supremacist violence, is perpetuated in which each attack is used to inspire the next one by taking on the defendants who are at this, uh, and the leaders who are at the center of this movement through our lawsuit we can have major financial, operational, and legal impacts on them and make crystal clear the consequences for being a part of this sort of racist, violent conspiracy. Thank you so much. It was really a chilling description of what we all need to be thinking about and focusing on. Charles, and my apologies for mispronouncing your last name initially. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to ask you uh, whether on the basis of your own research and writing and, and work, uh, whether you can uh, share with us how the Unite the Right rally ties into um, the deeper history of America. Why did a rally that ostensibly was about Confederate monuments and the removal of federal monuments become a neo-Nazi rallying cry. What's the connection there? Well, I think, well, first of all, thank you, Phyllis, as well as Amy for doing some of my, my work as a historian. You did a great job of laying out that history. Um, but for me, I think we have to really understand that as a nation, we've yet to deal with um, reckoning with how our nation is was conceived in white supremacy sexism and anti-black violence right and when we don't come since we haven't come to terms with that we um, see flashpoints such as these um, highlighted um, by amy and you know in many ways um, synonymous similar to what we saw with january the 6th um, you know i think um, it's just so consistent with our nation specifically as it relates to the ways in which we understand white supremacy um, and how we, uh, in many ways, give it a pass, specifically focusing on international um, terror and terrorism. And we fail to historically deal with white supremacist violence um, for some reason. I mean, and, I, and I, as a historian who's familiar with this, you know, these issues, I mean, when, the way white supremacy works, it thrives off of the suppression of narratives, right? And even the through line that um, Amy has laid out um, in terms of the history that she's making um, it is, it is essential as we, as we deal with um, and attempt to promote remedies for addressing some of these issues in the, legal, in the legal field as well. We have to understand that again, these are yes, flashpoints, but they're also a part of a through line, a line that can be drawn directly from the anti-Semitic and racist white supremacist actions of the um, 20th century to today. I mean, we it shouldn't take um, Charlottesville, uh, um, sh it shouldn't take Tree of Life, it shouldn't take, um, you know, the mother um, Emmanuel for us to recognize that these, it, these issues need to be addressed. And I think for something that I'm really um, glad about in many ways is the work that Amy is doing, not waiting on um, the government in many ways to do their job, right? And that's been the biggest task. And I've been asked this question before, post January 6th, um, you know, my biggest hope um, post January the 6th, and even after Charlottesville, you know, I admonished in my head, I haven't had the guts to write the op-ed yet, um, the president to not make the mistake that Lincoln made, right? In giving a pass post Civil War, to racist white supremacists, um, you know, and, and I think we're at a unique phase in this larger freedom struggle as a country where we need indeed presidential leadership, executive leadership, congressional leadership to draw a line in the sand when it comes to white supremacy, the same way white supremacist racist terror, the same way we drew a line in the sand um, post 9-11, right? Um, but until the government recognizes that and takes that step, I'm thankful for the work that Amy and others are doing. Um, and hopefully as we move forward um, and continue to promote um, you know, the shared humanity that um, the government will meet Amy and others halfway um, in doing this important work. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Amy, would you care to comment on that same question? Why did a did a uh, rally that ostensibly was about Confederate monuments turn in the direction that it did? Well, I, I think what Professor Chavis said is exactly right in that you can't look at Charlottesville outside of the long history of white supremacy in this country, which is a history that has frankly been the, the basis for so much of this country. It's um, It didn't start and stop in 2017 or during the four years of the Trump administration, as many would like to believe, because it feels better to believe that. Um, but it, it is it has been the history of this country and what we're seeing now with the rise of violent extremism targeting so many communities, including communities of color, Jews and others, is just a culmination of the current manifestation of that hate, of that white supremacy and other forms of extremism that have been there and, and in sometimes in many cases pushed into the shadows so that it manifested in sort of more subtle ways, but ways that I know the black and other communities felt viscerally on a daily basis. And when it when it sort of spills out onto our streets and into our churches, our synagogues and the ways that it has in recent years, it's so crucial that we understand that while there are always these excuses, these supposed flashpoints like the removal of the Confederate monuments in Charlottesville, they're really just that. They're excuses that are used to perpetuate the same sort of ideology and hate that has long been there and um, seizing on an opportunity, which in 2017 were, was, was a few different factors. One, I think social media has played a crucial role in allowing these extremists to connect, not just in specific communities, but across the country and around the globe in ways that made something like Unite the Right possible, whereas not that long ago it wouldn't have been. In the past, Klansmen would wear their white hoods and, be, and meet in the woods and be limited to the specific geographic area the specific geographic area where they operated now they can connect around the world and and it's important to understand unite the rate and so much other recent extremism in that through that lens of course they were particularly emboldened in 2017 following the election of president trump and who and when he then went on to affirm that there were fine people on both sides that continued that emboldenment that empowerment that many felt but i think again it's important to understand that extremism didn't start and stop with the Trump administration. And so all many of these factors combined um, to really create what became a perfect storm for something like Unite the Right um, that allowed these extremists to feel so empowered to descend on a city like Charlottesville, which as, as you of course know, fellas and many others do, is a progressive diverse city um, target people based on their race, their religion, and their willingness to defend the rights of others. And then, of course, try to, to blur the facts of what happened by immediately saying, well, this wasn't us, this was Antifa, this was Black Lives Matter, to change the narrative, as I think re both Reverend Vaughn and Professor Chavis have, have alluded to, that there's also an immediate, uh, immediate instinct by these extremists to try to to blur the facts of what has happened in order to to allow history to effectively keep repeating itself. And that's why it's so important that there be accountability, that we tell the story of what happened through efforts like this lawsuit, through events like this, so that there is that accountability that is there, that path towards justice so that we can finally break that cycle of violence as opposed to allowing these extremists to continue to perpetuate it. Yeah, and if I if I could just pick back real quickly, I think you know we when we see these monuments and we it's really never about the monument, right? That's um, and especially you know as historians, I'm so thankful for the work of David Blight and how he really dissects um, specifically these monuments, specifically around the time period in which they were erected and what goes into it, the meaning of it. Because you know if it was just a statue, that's one thing, but we know more than that, and this is why I think. The narratives, attempts at narrative suppression are so real. And for me as a historian in this area, um, it, it, you know, it needs to be understood as the lifeblood of, you know, white supremacy. They, this is how it all begins. You start with, you know, this whole idea of it being just about this monument, about some form of heritage. But then when you do more investigation, it, it becomes quite obvious that this is about racism and maintaining racial hierarchy. But I think what's uniquely significant about um, the Unite the Right rally was the moment that we were in as a country and the ways in which um, the rhetoric of a reprobate leader um, fueled um, 
those who had been in many ways continuing to be blatantly anti-Semitic and spewing their hate on social media and through the internet, they were emboldened in a unique way, which is again consistent with um, when we look at the history of white supremacy and how um, when rhetoric goes unchecked, it evolves into this. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the uh, actions were not as tragic as they were, not so much surprising um, for those who are consistent and understand this history. Um, but that's why we have to be consistent and move forward with justice. It has to be centered. I'm so glad you just said that about the Confederate monuments because <clears throat> I was also going to comment that those monuments went up. Uh, many people don't realize this in the aftermath of reconstruction in the 1920s. And they were reflections of white supremacy. They were reflections of the fact that whites were in charge despite the amendments that had given African Americans basic rights. And those monuments then, you know, become emblematic. And so they become emblematic of who the insiders are in the society and who the outsiders are. And Jews as well as blacks became outsiders in the 1920s and 1930s and 40s. So the, the, the monuments just become emblems of a much deeper set of issues as, as you have just told us. Um, so I'm wondering, uh, Charles, if, if you could just extend this a little further and talk a little bit about the relationship in American history between anti-Semitism and racism. I know you've done a lot of work on that issue. Um, and then perhaps uh, Amy might also tell us how those, that relationship ties into uh, the Signs versus Kessler case. Sure. So first to Charles. Sure, I think it's important to understand that both Nazism and, um, and you know, anti-Semitism and um, racism are both rooted in white supremacy. Right, we have to understand that and it's so easy in this country. Again, it's just a word that we don't wanna deal with in the US, but it needs to be said time and time again. Um, and for me as a historian, my work focuses on um, looking at black and Jewish relations during the first half of the 20th century. But I really look at the model specifically laid out um, during the uh, late 19th um, and early 20th century when both Blacks and Jews came together with this shared understanding of specific suffering. You had um, the lynching crisis taking place in the U.S., but you also had the Russian Jews escaping pogroms. Um, and there was a perfect storm of sorts coming to the Americas where there was a shared humanity and understanding of what um, white supremacy and what um, hatred would, could do and what rhetoric could turn into, right? Um, and for you know me, I think we can look to those historic models and those alliances um, as we um, begin to produce, develop remedies for dealing with um, you know this current iteration of white supremacy um, being um, laid laid out and laid bare before our eyes. Um, you know, I think for me, something that you know, being studying this and studying the work of religious leaders, um, interfaith leaders, and others who. Um, understood that there was a shared, you know, connection in many ways between the Black and Jewish struggle, specifically during the first half of the 20th century. It's something that I hope that we will, um, moving forward, learn from this past, these past experiences. When we even think about, you know, Mother Emanuel, Tree of Life, you know, we, we forget about the civil rights movement. We forget about the reason why a number of the Department of Justice organizations were even established was because of this white supremacist hatred, um, you know, in 60, post, um, around the late 60s, we had the formation of the, um, the um, oh my goodness, it's, it's blanking my, my mind now. The Civil um, Rights Division? Yes, the Civil Rights Division, where, you know, the, the organization was tasked with investigating these church burnings, right? And we also had synagogue burnings as well, right? And so we, the, the difficult thing is, you know, as a professor, I tell my students, the history is so much about the present, and we have to make those connections and recognize that these things are happening in a vacuum, that these are part of a long history that we have yet to confront. But one of the things that I hope this session does, as well as future sessions, is let both the Black and Jewish community know 
that um, we have to find a way to unite around um, stamping out white supremacy um, in this country. Um, and we have to look to those examples and look to that history um, and those shared struggles and coalitions to develop remedies as we move forward. I'm so glad you mentioned the Civil Rights Division and, and the Department of Justice, because I think one of the reasons, and, and you alluded to this earlier, is this case is, is sadly so important is because of the lack of action by the federal government over the last four years to hold extremists accountable, to hold those accountable who target so many communities, including communities of color, the Jewish community, and elsewhere. And the fact that the Civil Rights Division was actively disinvesting from this work at a time when it was more urgent than it's been in decades. And so it made our case, and it still sadly makes our case all the more relevant, it really the only legal effort to take on the broader leadership of this movement. And, and it's so important because all of our, it, this case illustrates better than, than so much how communities' fates are so deeply intertwined here, to build on your point. When these extremists marched on Charlottesville chanting things like Jews will not replace us, when they target a Pittsburgh synagogue because of its work with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, when they target Black churches and synagogues and mosques and Sikh temples and Latinx communities, all of that is part of a very specific white supremacist ideology that is sort of the modern day culmination of the very same white supremacy that has existed as long as this country, this idea of the great replacement or replacement theory, that Jews are the puppet masters who are effectively orchestrating the replacement of the white race through support for black people, brown people, refugees, immigrants, anyone who doesn't fit into their vile, narrow definition for what this country can be. And that conspiracy theory is both deeply anti-Semitic and also deeply racist because it posits that the black community, for example, could never achieve the things it has on its own. We couldn't have had our first black president. The Black Lives Matter protests couldn't have possibly been as uh, as sort of successful as they were as helping to sh shift the country's public consciousness on an issue, unless there was a wealthy puppet master pulling the strings. And so you see this in obvious vile and violent ways like they did, like we did in Charlottesville and Pittsburgh and elsewhere. We also see it in much more subtle ways that I think are equally dangerous. When you hear, for example, of George Soros supposedly funding the Black Lives Matter protests or funding a caravan coming up from Central America, that all harkens back to the same idea of the great replacement or the replacement theory. And we start to see this manifesting in increasingly mainstream ways where members of Congress espouse it, where Tucker Carlson gives it a primetime audience on Fox News, and that is in some ways even more dangerous than the obvious manifestations. But what it also tells us is that white supremacists know that by pitting communities against one another, it will make their chances of success far greater because as cheesy as it sounds, united we are stronger. And so when they're able to pit communities like the Black and the Jewish communities against one another, it only helps to further their, their work, further their mission. And as replacement theory, as these attacks all make clear, our fates are not separate. They're not happening in silos. What's happening in this country aren't isolated incidents, but a broader manifestation of an ideology that frankly hates all of us who are on this call today, whether because of the color of our skin or our religion or our willingness to stand up for the rights of other people based on their race or their religion. Mm -hmm. And so, by recognizing how deeply intertwined our fates are here, that I think is the most important thing many of us can do in beginning to actually grapple with the cycle of extremism in this country. By refusing to fall prey to white supremacist efforts to pit communities against one another, and instead recognizing that by joining forces, by recognizing how each and every one of our fates is deeply connected here, um, we can be far more effective in, in finally breaking this cycle. Well, we, we have an, um, a number of questions. I wanna make sure we can get to those. Um, and I also want to make sure that we have time on this uh, very tight program uh, to hear from Rabbi Press. So thank you both for those wonderful reflective uh, comments. Let me go to a, a first question that came in uh, by Sarah Friedman. That question is, why Charlottesville? Why, why was Charlottesville chosen? It has such a small Jewish population. You know, in fact, I know it doesn't even make the statistics of Jews in America when they talk about sizes of communities. 
So uh, Amy, I think you alluded to this a little bit in, in terms of the nature of the community, but I, I, you know, it would be good to hear from both of you about that. Yeah, I, I mean, look, I think Charlottesville was chosen because one, it created the excuse and that there was currently a debate happening in the community about removing a Confederate monument. And so that provided an excuse and two, it was, it's a diverse, progressively minded city with a large college, a large, a, a large black population, a Jewish community, and a variety of other communities that reflect so much of what these white supremacists hate. And so it really uh, was a, a sort of a perfect manifestation of everything these white supremacists look for and, and who to target with their extremism. And I, it, that being said, it's what happened in Charlottesville could have probably happened in so many other communities around this country. Charlottesville was the unfortunate target because of the excuse that the Robert E. Lee statue debate created. But it's important to understand, as we've been saying, that we've seen similar incidents. We haven't seen a Unite the Right, but we've seen Pittsburgh, Poway, Mother Emanuel, uh, El Paso, and so many other attacks that have been manifestations of the same white supremacist ideology, even if it happened in different forms. Yeah, and, and to my earlier point, it is literally, and well, we cannot indeed blame everything on this past previous four years, but to um, what I think is important for us to recognize is that um, we had to unite the right, because again, there was a reawakening so we did have you know, white supremacy, as we said, that it, it functioned and morphed in, into a unique form where you did, of course, had outliers in these events that you kind of laid out, um, Amy. But to, to, to have a unite the right, to have a collection and to make this, I'm trying to find a, a good way to say it, to, to have these individuals come out of the closet, if you will, and to celebrate the way that they were allowed to. It showed that there was a cultural shift um, necessitated by this, the previous administration that made this okay, right? To, you know, to, to be able to think about the privilege associated with being able to chant such vile hatred on the campus of a university. That is a privilege that um, many individuals who have been closeted or talking on their chats and blogs, they, they never really had this opportunity, but the stage was set for them by this previous administration and the, the license that they were given to be so openly and free about it. I think when we talk about um, you know, the Unite the Right rally, we have to look at it in that context and why it emerged. To your point, Amy, I don't think it had anything to do with, um, it could have been anywhere, but I think having the, the statue and the history that we know about, um, it just, it was, it made the most sense and it was an easy target in many ways. And if you have people of both Black and Jewish persuasion and connection, um, both individuals are always, it seems like, equally targeted in, in these mass, mo issue, mass movements and demonstrations or acts of ter terror. Um, I think about January the 6th. I was working on the forward for my book, and I had to take a week off because of, you know, my book is actually called The Silent Shore. It's about racial terror lynching in Maryland. Um, um, and the foreword was about January the 6th, you know, and I was bringing, and I, I had to stop. When I saw the Auschwitz t-shirt and the nooses um, that were just in full display on our nation's capital, and I was a part of a session consulting a museum about an exhibit um, that they were going to do on anti-Semitism and, um, and, and racism, and, you know, it's just like, at what point are we not going to get it, right? why it's so important for us to come together time and time again. I mean, it was so blatant there, um, but it's something that communities of color and also um, Jewish communities are, they're aware of, but it shouldn't take these um, dramatic episodes for us to wake up and, and unite. And so that's again, why I'm so proud of this, the work that you were doing, Amy, and the um, work of the conveners and convening this. We need to do more like this, an hour is, is not enough. So I'm, I'm calling for a, rant, a second part, a part two, part three. I'm in. <laughs> Let me just very, very quickly also add why Charlottesville. So, you know, I, I think we should forget that both uh, Richard Spencer and Jason Kessler 
yes. uh, are very familiar with Charlottesville and they were both students and graduates, I am sad to say, of the University of Virginia. They knew the, the territory, they knew the land, uh, the space, et cetera, how it could be manipulated in various ways. But let me, let me ask uh, one final question before, uh, before we introduce uh, Rabbi Press. Um, Amy, could you tell us a little bit about the current status of the case, uh, but also on a related note about some of what those who are working so intensively in, Ameri in Integrity First for America are facing? And then perhaps uh, before, before we ask Rabbi Prass for some comments, um, how, how people can help. Absolutely. Um, the lawsuit is, as, as everyone here knows, Charlottesville happened nearly four years ago this summer. Um, we are scheduled for trial finally this October in federal court in Charlottesville in the Western District of Virginia. The federal courthouse is right downtown, a few blocks away from Heather Higher Way, where the violence unfolded. And we are um, doing everything we can to make sure this court date holds because it's so critical that our plaintiffs finally have their day in court to hold accountable these defendants for the racist violence that they planned. As you can imagine, the defendants have tried every trick in the book to avoid accountability here, from filing motions to dismiss, to flouting court orders, and our team has been tireless in holding them accountable. Um, we won an important decision from the court nearly three years ago, rejecting their motions to dismiss, rejecting many of their arguments, including making clear that the First Amendment does not protect violence. Um, they have been uh, sanctioned tens of thousands of dollars. Two have actually had bench warrants issued issued for their arrest and one has already sat in jail. And we've won major evidentiary sanctions, which will have a big impact at trial in terms of the instructions the jury gets um, to treat um, as an established fact certain core allegations as it relates to at least one defendant in our suit. And so we are going to trial scheduled for this fall, October 25th in Charlottesville. Um, and we are committed to making sure that these defendants are finally held accountable for their conspiracy. And when we win large financial judgments from the court, um, we can effectively bankrupt, disrupt, and dismantle the leaders and the groups that are really at the center of this movement. To, your, to the second part of your question, one of the other ways that the defendants have tried to avoid accountability, of course, is through violence, which is exactly um, their MO, as we saw in Charlottesville and in so many other places. They use threats of violence, harassment, other forms of uh, violence to target it at our lawyers, our plaintiffs, at IFA, um, everything from uh, the defendants personally threatening us, as they have, to, uh, to of course, uh, their use of social media to inspire their followers to action, which is in some ways even more dangerous. And so, to be completely frank, we have incredible lawyers donating millions upon millions of dollars in legal work and time on this case, but the biggest line item in our budget at IFA is security to keep our team safe, to keep us safe, to keep our plaintiffs safe um, because of the use of harassment and threats to go after those in an attempt who, who are holding them in accountable who are holding them accountable in an attempt to avoid accountability. And so for folks who are looking for a way to help, um, there's so much that you can do. You can specifically get involved with IFA by going to our website, integrityfirstforamerica.org, signing up for case updates. If you have the ability to donate, please know that every single dollar directly supports this lawsuit, specifically security and evidence collection costs to make sure that our team is safe can win at trial this fall. Um, we are a 501c3, which means we are nonpartisan and your gifts are tax deductible. But also more broadly, don't let this issue fall off the radar screen. Keep making clear that we're facing a crisis of extremism and our officials on all levels of the government, the private sector, and so many others have an obligation here. I think it's really easy to feel hopeless and helpless and scared in a moment like this. I no, I do, and I, we haven't, haven't talked much about this, but I'm the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors. And I think often about the parallels in my family's history and the moment that we're living in. And it's easy to think about those dark places in our history, those dark times. But I think that there's one huge difference from my grandparents' generation to ours, which is that we live in a country that has rule of law, that has a justice system, that has laws like the Ku Klux Klan Act. And while we have to fight like crazy to protect them, we can use them as we are to take action. We have to fight like crazy to make sure that our justice system works equitably and fairly for everyone. 
but we can still continue to use that system to hold those accountable who seek to undermine our civil rights, who violently target our communities. And so in some many ways that gives me optimism, that gives me hope that we have these tools that we can use them to fight back. And if you would like to be a part of that, I would really encourage you all to get involved through Integrity First for America. Give if you can, do whatever you can to make sure that this issue remains front and center in your community um, and across this country at a moment of such crisis. Thank you so much to both of you for this sobering and very rich discussion, both uh, to alert us to thinking more deeply about the history of this country and also uh, paying greater attention to the kind of extremism that we're currently facing and the very important work that's being done uh, by Integrity First for America. I'd like to now introduce Rabbi Joseph Prass. Rabbi Prass is the director of the Weinberg Center for uh, Holocaust Education at the Bremen Museum in Atlanta, one of our current sponsors. Rabbi Prass has been teaching about the Holocaust for over 20 years in schools, in colleges, in synagogues, and in camps. And he is also currently a part-time rabbi uh, of Congregation Nair Tamid in Marietta, Georgia. We have asked Rabbi Prass if he would make some general remarks, unfortunately quicker than <laughs> we would like because we could go on for hours in, in these important uh, discussions, but to just reflect on the reactions of uh, some Atlantans who are Holocaust survivors to what we are witnessing in the United States, both in terms of the Unite the Right rally and uh, to the insurrection on January 6th and other uh, similar um, events of violence. So welcome Rabbi Press. Thank you very much, Phyllis. Thank you. And I wanna um, thank everyone who's been part of this program today, um, the panelists, the participants, it has been a powerful uh, an important program. Um, at the Bremen Museum, we welcome thousands of visitors to learn about the lessons of the Holocaust. We tell that story of the Holocaust from the standpoint of those who experienced the Holocaust. And we tell of their fate, their struggle, their resilience. And in almost all of the cases, those who visit our museum are going to hear from a Holocaust survivor and to understand what that terrible period of inhumanity was like. And so I want to share just a few of their reflections who I've heard from in the past several years. And in light of all of that, I, one question I'm often asked when people visit our museum, they ask, can history repeat itself? And that's been a topic that's been discussed um, in this program today. And when I hear that, I say, I hope not. I hope that history doesn't repeat itself, but I will say that it sure rhymes at times. And that it's not just my opinion. I, I want to share with one survivor who, when she saw what happened in Charlottesville, um, for so many of them, it was terrifying that it brought back visceral reactions of seeing people marching in the streets with torches. They remembered how their families and some of them actually heard Jews will not replace us and blood and soil were phrases that they heard decades ago. And so to that one survivor that I mentioned, uh, just shy of being 90 years old, when most of us are looking forward to relaxing, looking at our grandchildren, she, a survivor of Poland, said, I need to get out and start speaking again. I need to tell the lessons of hatred, of bigotry, and I need to be speaking again. Put me in front of groups. And we did. And she was a powerful, powerful speaker. There was an occasion that one group was visiting our museum, and as they were looking at the historical pictures on the wall, they said, oh, that one, I saw that just last week on the news. They were looking at 1930s Germany and riots and rallies there, and what they were speaking about, though, was Charlottesville, and that was just a gut punch to one of our docents, who was the child of survivors as well. If the young people can see the parallels, it's hard to understand why some of our elected leaders can't see the incredible warning that is going on. 
And as we've seen, these racist, these xenophobic, these hateful messages in our nation's capital this past January, and the lack of clear condemnation from some of our elected leadership, it led another survivor to say to me, um, she said, I didn't survive the Holocaust to live in a democracy that elects such people who are so out of touch with decency and reality. It doesn't repeat itself, but our survivors see the rhyme in what is happening. It sounds similar. It's not the same, but it is so similar. And when the Nazis were elected to power in 1933, Amy just mentioned this, one of the first things they sought to do was to deny the rights of other minorities in Germany that they systematically took away those laws. And we have to be so careful in our country as governors, as municipalities, and for heaven forbid, our federal level takes away those laws as we're there in Germany. Nationalists are seeking to disenfranchise others day by day. And so as I prepare to close, a teaching from the Jewish tradition, well, one of our sages, Hillel, said, if I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? It's a great pleasure to be part of uh, this program where uh, Integrity First for America is saying, if not now, when? We have to speak up. I hope that one of the parallels of the Holocaust is that we will not see the large numbers of bystanders and collaborators who allow that human tragedy to unfold. And so it's just been wonderful to be part of this program that's doing exactly the opposite of fighting hatred and bigotry in any form and making sure that it has no foothold here in our democracy. And so now let me invite uh, to close uh, for, for uh, the final closer, uh, Jay Silverberg, president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society um, to make the very final remarks. Uh, Rabbi, thank you. Before closing our program today, I want to thank our co-sponsors who have been unwavering in supporting and sharing a mutual interest in this critically important issue. Um, our focus as a society, certainly their focus as organizations is to interpret history, but also it's just as important to study it while it happens. Thank you to the Bremen Museum and to the National Center for Civil and Human Rights, both in Atlanta, to the Jewish Community Relations Council, uh, to the Jewish Council, both of, uh, all of whom are using their extraordinary venues um, and of course their expertise to further the cause of civil decency, respect and understanding. To our panel of speakers, Reverend Vaughn, Rabbi Prass, Professor Chavis, my friend and colleague, Phyllis Leffler. Um, and finally, to focus on why we gathered here today, Integrity First for America. I was introduced to IFA two years ago in Charlottesville during our society's annual conference and have since monitored its groundbreaking essential work about which we learned today. And I can tell you the session that we were in was just as chilling as this conversation has been uh, this afternoon. As president of the Southern Jewish Historical Society, I was privileged to lend our organization support to this program. And likewise, I'm proud to say I have provided personal financial support to the IFA. Their work is likely to be a part of our society's legal landscape for many, many years, and it requires financial support. I say that again, their work is likely to be a part of our society's legal landscape for many years. They need our help. As you allocate your dollars for various organizations and causes, please consider contributing to Integrity First for America. Um, Amy, Adina, and Alexis who've been behind the scenes and to all of your IFA colleagues, our abiding thanks. To all of you, thank you very much and good afternoon, everyone.